Well, let's jump in. Are you ready? Let's jump in deeply here in verse 34. This is where we picked up from last week. Or we pick up from last week. Verse 34, and I read, it says, Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus had told them, they've been debating about the manna that Moses gave. And, and they said, well, you know, Moses gave us manna. First of all, that's not true. Moses didn't give them anything. God gives all good gifts. Scripture says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, which is above. Everything good in our lives, God blesses us with. Very clearly from Scriptures. Now, He gives you the ability to work. He gives you the mind to think. He opens doors for you that you think it's just your good looks and charismatic personality. Right? But thank God we've got someone working on our behalf behind the scenes that's even in our foolishness, he's, he's still working and ministering and opening those doors and providing those things for us. And so they, they ask a question, uh, again, about this confirmation. And, and he says this, and so they said, well, Lord, always give us that bread. But they were still stink, thinking in the physical, the, the benefit, the blessing, the feel good, the fill my belly. And that's really what Jesus said. You don't really want to sign. You want your bellies filled again. You enjoyed your little fish dinner we had out on the lake and, and you want some more of that because it was, it was the best you've ever had. It didn't cost you a penny. I'm always looking for those kind of meals, aren't you? And so they were pursuing Jesus for those very, very reasons. And so I asked the question as we closed out, I said, well, so are they ready? I mean, with that statement, are they ready? And then we finished out last week by saying, but the bigger question is, are you ready? Are you ready to stop following Jesus from a shallow perspective? Are, are you willing to realize that, oh, it's a cliche in our culture, I know, but life really is not about you. It's about God creating you. It's about God loving you. It's about God sustaining you, absolutely. But it's about God working through you to show his glory to the nations, to impact a world that without Christ has no hope, no chance. And God wants to so transform your heart, so get you to a place of engagement that your life, every moment of every day, is totally consumed for his glory and for what he has planned so that others, those that are not in some church this morning, some that don't yet know his wonderful mercy and grace, so that they might have an opportunity and we as a church, we continue to work on that. We, we're continuing to be more of that kind of church. It's something that the church really, I think, has been doing since her history, since her inception, long before I became the pastor. But we continue to fine-tune that and direct our purpose toward reaching our world for Christ, being used of him to do just that. So are you ready? Now, verse 35, this is fresh today. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Now, you remember verse 34? Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. I am the bread of life. Hello? I, I just read that with that kind of inflection. It's, it's as though, have you not heard anything I've said to this point? Now, we all get that, don't we? Because some of us have been in, sitting in church most of our lives. And we are still missing the massive signals of the working of the Holy Spirit. We are still oblivious quite often to what God is trying to say to us at this very moment. And often that's because we have God pushed aside. We relegate him to some historical place in antiquity in our lives. But we don't understand that he is moment by moment daily trying to have a vibrant, living, passionate relationship with us and, and to lead us step by step in life. I, I'm convinced the modern church really doesn't get that. And so Jesus just jumps out and says, I am. Ego am I is the words there, the original words that he used. Yes, ego, just like the waffle. I've tried to figure that out for years. You know, why would they choose ego and looked at the etymology of the word? But he, he's saying that. He's saying, I am. It's amazing because in the original language here, he uses the tense. And in Greek, tense is significant. It's different than it is with English as we would understand it. But he uses the present tense. Now, why is that significant? Because present tense would imply that there is no completion. There is no ending. And so whatever it is that Jesus is saying here when he says, I am, he's saying, I always have been, I am at this moment, and I always will be. Now, that's good, right? 
And so this is the first flash, which by the way is, is solely used in John's gospel, in John's record. It's the first flash that we see where Jesus is really boldly issuing this one of seven statements. Some people say eight, depending on how you divide them up. But solidly we can say one of seven statements. And Jesus saying, is saying, listen, I always have been, I am right now, and I always will be the bread of life. Now, again, culturally, this concept of bread was big time to the Jewish people and to the audience that he was speaking to in this day. I mean, this was, just, this was one of the most basic. It, it was, well, I guess it could say it this way. It was the fundamental sustaining element of life. The absolute fundamental sustaining element of life. And so for Jesus to say, I am the bread of life, they connected it. Now, they've been there with the feeding of the 5,000. Remember the bread they had with the fish? And then we see them talking about manna, which was God bringing bread from heaven back years prior to this as they were coming out of the, the slavery, the bondage of Egypt. And so this, this concept of bread was fresh on their minds. It was, it was right in front of them in, in every way possible. And so he makes this declaration, I am the bread of life. I am the fundamental sustaining element of life. Well, that's absurd. I mean, he's standing right there before them. I mean, how weird is that? For him to say, I am the bread of life. I promise you, if you come back next Sunday, it gets even weirder. I mean, it, ooh, I mean, he gets out there. And some can't handle it. Did you know there are three main kinds of bread? I mean, think about this. I think it's important to understand this. There's, there's a category, three categories. They call it what, the high rising, you know, it's the kind of stuff you put in a pan there's high-rise bread, there's, and, and a lot of different kinds fall into that category. There's the, the medium-rise, like your rye breads and things like that. And then there's the low-rise, which practically no-rise, which we call, does anybody know? Flatbread is probably the most common way to express that. And bread literally was the staple item in their diet. Now, again, you've you got to understand that because it helps you grasp the weight of this statement. I keep saying that fundamental sustaining element. So, 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 so significant. Now, bread contains, you know, carbohydrates, fiber, protein, fats, vitamins, and minerals, right? And so literally, the bread, and it's not so much toxic like so much of what we take in today, but the bread that they would have been so accustomed to would have been wonderful for the body. Now, the carbohydrates are important. You know that, right? Because the heart, body takes the carbohydrates and breaks it down into glucose. And that glucose, combined with the oxygen in the mitochondria, then creates this energy which comes through when we have this respiratory aerobic activity. So it's vital for life, right? Okay, you're not impressed. Let me give you another one. How about fiber? <laughs> How about fiber? Fiber has this soluble, soluble fiber. It's an amazing thing. As it gets into the body through the bread, it then breaks down. It gets into the digestive tract in the form of a gel. And that gel actually protects the lining of the digestive tract and helps to keep us alive. Now, you folks that thought you were just so cool because you want to be on the cover of a magazine and not eat bread, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and we could continue like this. I mean, we could go through with the, the, everything else, the protein. We could go down to the vitamin, all those things. But I think you get, get the picture, right? It is absolutely critical, and, and they understood that. Now, I know how some of you think. I've kind of figured you out. You know, really, next week marks two years I've been here. And so I'm going to say this to you. Some of you right now, you're going, so what? Right? <laughs> so what? Thank you for the lesson on bread. Not really getting a job at a bakery. It's not helping me at all. Oh, 
Oh, but it is. Fundamental, sustaining element of life. Breads contain all the macronutrients that you need for your body to operate physically. Again, you may say, so what? Again, you may say, so what? (sighs) You were all outside yesterday, weren't you? You're tired today, aren't you? You got out there cleaning stuff and playing and yeah. So again, you may say, so what? So what? what? Thank you for asking that. I like that. So if breads, and Jesus says, Jesus says, I am the bread of life, then here's the so what. Jesus provides all you need to operate spiritually. Jesus, just like bread, provides all you need to operate physically, the right kind of bread can, let me, let me say that, with water. Jesus provides all that you need to operate spiritually. Wow. So where do we go from here? Ooh, look at verse 36. But I said to you, all right, now he's giving them this great truth, right? You, you think, man, now, oh, they're, 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 so they're, right now they should be going, wow. They should be going, wow, right? But look what it says in verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me, and, and yet you do not believe. Did you get that in verse 36? So you've seen him, but you still don't believe. So now the intensity is rising in the conversations so much that the conversation went something like this. Now that, that's what it said right there in the scripture, if you didn't catch that, right? We, we want answers. And Jesus said... You've seen me, and you don't believe. What's he saying? You can't handle the truth. It's a paraphrase, but it's pretty much the same thing. Big question. Can you handle the truth? Can you honestly handle the truth? There's a lot of you in this room, you've been under the teaching of God's word a vast majority of your life. And I'm not the Holy Spirit, and so I can't say this with authority, but I would guess that yet many of you under the sound of my voice right now, your heart may be as cold and as hard and as indifferent to the things of God as it's ever been. We've already kind of gone through what that would look like. We talked about loving the same things that Christ loved. Do you love his local church? Do you love serving in his local church? Do you love being a part of God's great team and being focused on what God's called the local body of believers to do in this particular community? Is there that passion in your heart? And quite often just as they would do from time to time, they would point to other issues and other things and get sidetracked and distracted. And the reality was they were not yet ready for Christ to do a deeper work in their hearts. They wanted to hold on to what they knew and what they have always experienced. They were okay with the free fish dinner, you know, the high times. I shouldn't use that phrase. That means something different in Colorado. <laughs> they were okay for the big moments. But to come to the sobering reality of where they were in relationship to Christ, man, I've got my schedule, I've got my life, I've got things the way I want it, I, I, I just, you know, I just want to have fun and leave me alone. You you can't handle the truth. Can you handle the truth? In 
You see, here's what we need to learn. Jesus never alters the truth to accommodate the culture. If I don't say anything that matters to me today more than this, I want you to get this. Jesus never accommodates the culture, never alters the truth to accommodate the culture. Most of you this week, I hope, I hope that you, like me, wept when you heard the report on the news that there would be no charges, no serious charges to the individual who literally cut out a baby out of a mama's stomach and the baby died. No charges because it was not a a baby. Because, yeah, right on key. Because it's not a lie, it's not a real baby if it hasn't drawn a a breath outside of the body in Colorado state law. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. That is a very bad law. And God help us. God help us. You look around these children in the room. You look around these babies in the room. You're going to say they didn't exist before they came outside? I am showing restraint at this very moment. Jesus never alters the truth to accommodate culture. The things that we believe that Jesus taught are being hammered right now with an intensity like I've never seen it in my lifetime. But I want you to hold on to this. Jesus will never alter the truth to accommodate culture. Stick with Jesus. Because one day when all this garbage is gone, it's going to be you and Jesus. Jesus will never alter the truth to accommodate culture. Let me get off of that. Verse 37. Jesus goes on. He says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Is that stinking amazing? I mean, is that just unbelievably amazing? Now, now understand something. Romans is real clear that n- nobody comes to God on their own. God initiates that. I- I've had so much fun reading this and reading the, the ping pong opinions on this verse. This is one of those volatile verses that all these people who think they're theologians love batting around back and forth. And it's amazing. Really, nobody can agree. There are variations on this over and over and over. But I love this. As I read this, notice a couple things here. It says that all the Father gives me, now notice that, will come to me. So if we're ever going to come to Christ, it will be because God the Father, by the Holy Spirit, will begin to tweak your heart and put a desire in you to come to Christ. And you you cannot come to Jesus just with an intellectual approach and have anything lasting happen. Now you can sign up for your religion and you can practice your religion based on your cultural morality all your life, absolutely. But for there to be a radical transformation of who you are, to forgive you of your sin, to make you right with God, to give you a new mind, a new heart, to indwell you with the person of the Holy Spirit and give you a hunger and thirst for things of God like you've never known, only God can begin that process. And only God can complete that process. But then notice what he says. John records it very clearly. And the one who comes to me... (laughs) I will certainly not cast out. Now, this this is where the theologians get twisted. Just about everybody agrees. Now, there are some weirdos who don't. But just about everybody agrees that it starts with God, it ends with God. They get that part. But for us, 
There are a lot of people that seem, they struggle with this, this uh, somewhat human and limited perspective, I guess, in that some people cannot see how divine sovereignty, and I wrote this down because I didn't want to mess it up, how divine sovereignty and human responsibility can work together. But over and over and over and over and over and over in Scripture, we see it. And it's not one side or the other. You say, Pastor, we really don't, because the majority of you could care less what I'm talking about right now. But a couple of you are going, okay, I want to hear it, I want to hear it. Listen, there is no conflict to God. The conflict is only in us. There is no conflict to God. I love this. One of my favorite quotes, and uh, Joshua Van Hall quoted something from Spurgeon this weekend that I just love, but one of my favorite, and it sort of sparked this in me, I remember this. When a church member one time asked Charles Spurgeon, arguably one of the greatest expositors of God's word of all time, when they asked him how he reconciled these two human, from a human perspective, tensions, divine sovereignty and human responsibility Spurgeon's answer was spot on Spurgeon said I never try to reconcile friends I love that I love that and I believe that's exactly what the Bible teaches now are there others who see it different ways yeah but I believe clearly it is initiated by God but I believe the scripture also teaches human responsibility because he says who will Come, And I see that all throughout Scripture. Here, you say, what are you saying, Pastor? I want to make it as simple as I can. If you sense that God is doing a work in your life and drawing you to Jesus, your part is to respond and come. That settles the what do I do. It's respond. It's come. God puts that in your heart. Now respond, come, say yes to Christ. Move from your casual approach to the things of God to to an approach that is deeply committed by the Spirit of God that actually empowers you to do that. Respond to what Christ is saying to you right from his word and confirming by his Spirit. Look in verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who has sent me. Look in verse 39. This is the will of him who has sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing. Folks, listen. When God the Father draws you, when you respond to that overture of love and grace, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Christ will never lose anyone that comes to him. Remember, salvation is not by anything you did. So walking away from it is not by anything you did. It is grace. It is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes, and that's not some mental assent, remember. And it's not just for salvation. Michael talked about this last week. It's, It's for daily living as well. Will you trust and rely on him? Will you put your full weight in Christ, on Christ every day for every decision, for every activity, believing? And who believes in him will have eternal life and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Speaking of that coming resurrection of all, Now, let me go back to verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. It illustrates two of the strongest desires of humanity, hunger and thirst. The Samaritan woman he'd already dealt with, which we looked at, he'd already dealt with this issue of thirst, and man, she connected with that. Would they connect with this idea of completely satisfied in Christ. What's the key to that? I'm almost done, so listen carefully. I shouldn't have said that. That's like having points on an outline. If you have three or four, as soon as they give you the last one, boop, you're done. So you think, now we're over. No, no, we got 30 more minutes, okay? Stay awake, all right? Don't miss this. Here's what Christ is saying, I believe. It must become 
personal. It must become personal. I I am the bread of life, Jesus says. I I am what you're looking for. It, It must become personal. It's not good enough that it's a part of what Riverside believes and even foundational to what Riverside believes and you come to Riverside. That's not the connection you need. You will still spend an eternity separated from God if that's all you get. It's not that you go to the trailhead. It's not that you're in a small group. And by the way, you all had that food today. And we are never doing that again because half the group is sound asleep right now. You're like, out on me. So what do I mean? It must become personal. For me, it's going to read like this. I am Tony's bread of life. I am Tony's bread of life. That, it's personal. Jesus was saying, Tony, I am what you need to be sustained spiritually. But can I tell you, even if your pastor believes that, and I do with all my heart, that doesn't help you. Now, what you've got to do is take the Tony out. And you've got to put your name in. Now, let's read it, and I want everybody just to say their first name when we get to the blank. Are you ready? Okay, look look at the person beside you that's asleep and nudge them. Okay, say, come on, come on. All right, good, thank you, thank you. Thanks for the help. Are you ready? You know what we're going to do now. You're going to put your name in the blank. So, we're going to read it. I am going to put your name. You're you're good. I have to tell you folks this several times. You just, you, you ready? Here we go. All right. I am bread of life. Let's try it again. I am bread of life. Is it true? A lot of yeses. And say, Pastor, come on now. Tell me specifically, how do I do that? We've been interviewing a prospective student pastor the last, oh, five or six weeks. And the other day I took him on a hospital visit with me. And I believe in having multiple interviews in multiple locations, different settings. I wanna wanna see how people operate. And uh, as we were driving, we had quite a long drive and I said, okay, I do not have a personal relationship with Christ. I want you to lead me to Christ. I said, I can learn more about this dude in, in 30 minutes than I would 10 hours of questioning about his theology. And so he started off kind of uh, so, uh, 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 you know, because they just put him on the spot, you know, and it's it's kind of weird trying to lead the pastor to Christ, you know, it's just kind of a little (laughs) strange, I guess. And then he got right into it and it was, it was all, he did a great job. And I made it hard on him because he'd say something and he'd say, well, you know, because God says, well, I don't believe in God. It's kind of like he rolled his eyes. He went, okay, here we go. And he, and he said, well, you know, and the Bible says, and I said, well, yeah, it's, it's just a book put together by a bunch of people. And man, he was spot on. And he came on to the end and he, he finally, he said, he said, you know, Tony, he said, the bottom line is, he said, you have to decide in your heart, is God drawing you? Is God calling you? And I remember exact words he said. And I said, well, you know, I, I think maybe he is, but I, I, I'm not ready. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, again, I understand how you view the Bible, but it says not to put it off, that you don't know that you'll get another chance. And I said, leave me alone. I don't believe anything you said. I'm walking away. He was crushed. <laughs> and then I let him off the hook and... Uh, But I got to thinking about that. And I got to thinking about you. And I got to thinking about the opportunity I'd have today to stand before you. And I want to ask you, have you made it personal? Have you come to that place in your life where you have turned to Christ with your heart and your soul and all that you are and said, I am ready to follow you and you only? I am willing to put my trust, my total faith and confidence and rely on you completely. I want you to cleanse me of my sin. I want you to 
take control of my life. Be my Lord, guide me, direct me, and let me walk with you the rest of my life. Have you done that? I pray you have because he's all you need spiritually as you move forward throughout all eternity. Pray with me if you will. Father, thank you for, again, the scriptures and God, while we might not see everything eye to eye and always agree on every point, God, uh, it's just really hard for us to argue that you are all we need. And so God, today I pray that we will put our total trust and hope in you. And I I pray for those in the room who've not yet made it personal. I, I pray today will be the day. God, I pray that they will receive your wonderful, wonderful love, forgiveness of sins. God, I pray today would be a day of new birth for them, that Lord, they would look back And they would think about this date as they move forward in life and today would be their spiritual birthday. God, move with your spirit. We need you. And we pray and trust in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm gonna invite you to stand with me. And we're not finished, but we're getting close. We're gonna sing a song together and I want to ask some of our ministers to come down here to the front. We have people that just about every Sunday that just come and sort of kneel down here and maybe pray about things. Some people come and want to be prayed for. We'd love to pray with you. I can tell you if you come and kneel, more than likely someone will come and just slowly, quietly come up behind you and just pray over you even as you're praying. But maybe one of these staff members, maybe one of our ministers here, maybe they can some way assist you. Maybe today's the day you'd like to make it personal and you're not really sure how to do that. Just come and grab one of these ministers by the hand and say, I want to make it personal today. I promise you, they know exactly what God says to do and they will lead you through that very simple process of placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe there's something else that's going on in your life. I mean, last Sunday, we had a guy just right there in the service, gave his life to Christ and we celebrated at the end of the service. It was an amazing thing. We're getting to see that on an awful and a frequent basis. We'd love for you to be part of that. So as we sing, come on, God's doing something in your heart. Respond to him. Respond to him. Because we love you. We care about you. Let's sing and you come.